Hey everybody, Coach here. Thanks for taking a couple minutes to join me here today. I'm sitting at the Knoxville Botanical Garden and Arboretum for you. I thought I would take this in as I'm heading north into Virginia and checking out some other sites all the way up in the northeast. Hey, this week we are talking about ground covers. Ground covers, something other than lawn. Yes, indeed. Hey, stay with me because at the end I got a little bit of a trending uh, shall we say landscape theme that's really starting to come into its own over the last mm, five to ten years. Whether you're a hold in the hillside for, you know, erosion control, uh, maybe cascading over a beautiful retaining wall that you built, or maybe creeping in between flagstone pavers or concrete pavers you put in place, ground covers are a fantastic and versatile plant material that you can use in your ornamental landscape. Guaranteed. I've used them just as much, if not more, than just turf grass. Anyway, hey, I'm glad you're here. Let's get this thing creeping along, shall we? <laughs> creeping along. Get it? Oh, my wife says I have a million of them. Anyway, Maestro, take it away. Hey, I'm Matt, you can call me coach. You know, every week I bring with you DIY landscape education in the form of landscape design concepts, theories, and practical applications so you can get professional landscape results under your own power, be a heck of a lot more self-reliant in this day and age, and save a boatload of money in the process. Man, you know, after, geez, over 20 years in the green industry as a designer, contractor, educator, retail nursery manager, I bring with me a lot of knowledge and experience that I want to impart to you, the new self-reliant educated homeowner of today. And one of the main focuses on today's video is about choosing the right one. Choose the wrong one and you'll be banging your head against that proverbial retaining wall going, why in the hell did I pick this plant? But ground covers are our topic today, so let's move forward. Many, many years ago when I was uh, the proverbial noob in the green industry when I didn't know anything about plant material hardly at all. But I had a good desire to learn and a great work ethic, I thought. So when I started at the nursery, one of the very first sections that I was introduced to was uh, ground covers and color. That was the basically the, the section of the nursery that I got my feet wet in. And I got my feet wet in by the baptism by fire, literally. I learned how to unload trucks in a hurry and then the tests started coming. And the tests were really straightforward. A lot of more about ground covers because we carried a few dozen different kinds of ground covers. And we, according to the owner's edict, we had to know exactly what the ground cover did, what applications that went in, what kind of environment was best, and how they performed best for our customer. Thank you very much, Navalee's Nursery, which is now called Sloats up there in Northern California. And to the owner and his son, Bert and Buzz Bertolero. I don't know if they're still around or not, but man, they sure did uh, set me on a path of great green industry knowledge for me. So every week we had to take a written test. It generally involved like five or six different ground covers and you had to study up on them. You had to do that in that Sunset Western Garden book, which is where a lot of the answers came from. So I was handed a sheet of paper on my first day and said, at the end of your fifth day, you'll be taking a test and you'll have to know everything you need to know about these particular ground covers. And there was the list. So on my lunch hour and at home, I was, I was going through and reading and studying and studying and reading. And then come that fifth day, I had to take the test. And I did okay on them. You know, I, I got through like 35 or 40 of them before I was moved to another section where more tests were involved. It was a great place to work, a hell of an environment. But we're talking about ground covers today and what are some of the applications, some of the common names, some of the environments that can go in and some scenarios that you might have to face and conquer on your own. So let's look at these, shall we? There are a few ways that ground covers can be used in the ornamental landscape. And obviously, duh, one of the very first ones is covering the ground. You know, instead of uh, mulching everything or graveling everything, you can use ground cover. And like I said at the top of the, the show, down at the end, we are going to talk about a new trend. So stick with me on this. But let's talk about covering that ground. When we're talking about covering the ground, we're talking about a solid matting most of the time. 
most. There are times when you don't want it to be a solid mass. Maybe you have big clusters of submerged boulders and trees and shrubs, and you just want them to be kind of a, a wanderer, and you have to pick the right one to do that so that it doesn't wander up over and into your tree and up to the top like some ivies and things do. So that's one particular application. How about another one? Those we generally call uh, erosion control or large scale ground covers. And they're the ones that have the real tenacity, a real tenacious root system, one that can stand up to droughts, stand up to heat, and stand up to uh, gravity because most of the time it's gonna be on a hillside type application, which we'll go into a scenario here in just a second. How about spillers? Spiller type of ground covers are those that are gonna work just merely on the, the fact of gravity. They're gonna grow and then they're gonna basically just spill over an environment, a wall of some kind like a retainer, maybe a boulder, maybe a, a hillside, maybe a pot, maybe something that you could think of beyond those things. Another one and the last one that I thought of was a cascader. And cascader is similar to spiller, except maybe it's cascading down a hill. There isn't really the need for erosion control, but you just want it to spill down. And we'll go into some of the selections on those as well. So I've used ground covers in hundreds and hundreds of different landscapes that I've designed and installed over the years, including the last house I had at Weed Patch Ranch in Northern California. There I used a lot of ground cover selections in between roses, especially on the big pondless waterfall in the backyard, in between some perennials. And you know, they, uh, they really kind of picked up the pace when say the perennials weren't quite blooming yet, but the ground cover was coming into vogue. So focus would be that on the attention of the ground cover color, and then it transitioned over the perennial color. And it worked out really well. Not to mention that the, the pondless waterfall did have a bit of a hill to it. And so I had things like carpet bugle, I had uh, vinca in there, variegated vinca, I had some gazania in there as well. So it worked out really well. There was color at various times of the year, and then the perennials and some of the shrubbery color took over, and then there was the water feature itself. So it worked out really well. Ground cover availability. You know, uh, most of the time, I'm not, no, I'm not gonna make a big broad brush approach to this, but most of the time, ground cover availability is not at the box stores, not that much. They're more into cell pack color, maybe some perennials, some bread and butter shrubbery, and if you've noticed, that's kind of where it stops. Uh, but ground cover selections get mostly the attention from the mom and pop and specialty nurseries, and that's where you're gonna get your biggest knowledge base your biggest knowledge base for what ground cover would be best for the application you want to use. And you can tap into the staff at one of those places and get a good education in a short period of time. You know, most of the availability comes from a, uh, either a mud flat, you know, it's like a 16 or 18 inch square mud flat where you have the ground cover starts that are in there generally in, mm, 50-ish, 48 to 60-ish little starts that have been started in there, and then also in cell pack flats, and on occasion, gallon can and four inch as well. So you can find, depending on the varieties you're looking for. If you're looking for shrubbery type of ground cover, you're probably gonna go four inch in gallon can, and if you're looking at creepers and other kinds, they kind of lend themselves to the mud flats and cell packs. So for the average homeowner and layman, most of the time when you speak the word ground cover, everybody thinks about a little creeper that stays very close to the ground and maybe a couple inches of growth and it runs and roots and that kind of, and that's what people think about ground covers. But they are into the shrubbery range as well too. So let's talk about some of those guys and what their application would be. Now, earlier on, I talked about some of those applications. Here's your first scenario. It's one that I took right out of the annals of being a contractor. So I had a big hillside. The hillside was about a 25 degree slope, something right around in there. It went up and out almost to the half acre size, a half acre hillside, and it did have plantable soil. 
I did run irrigation up. I ran it up one valve up one side of the hill, one valve up the other side of the hill, and then I watered horizontally on it. And then we started to plant it. This was in zone eight, as I recall. This had water to it, like I just mentioned. It had full southern facing exposure and full sun. So there's your scenario. What kind of a ground cover do you think would be best in that situation? Zone eight, full sun, southern exposure, 25 degree slope. What kind of ground cover would you look for? Well, here's what I came up with. In the design, I figured I was gonna use a multitude of ground covers. And when I say that, it doesn't mean just creepers. There was a combination of shrubbery that went to about three feet tall, ground covers that went to about 18 inches or so, and then boulders placed, a couple of trees, and by the time we got this hillside done, it looked really good. What ground cover would you use? How about something like uh, baby tear? No? Okay. How about uh, scotch moss? Uh, Corsican mint? No? Why not? What's wrong with those? They're ground covers. They're little creepers. Wouldn't they do a good job in that? No, you're right, they, they would not do a good job. So what we ended up using was a combination of emerald carpet manzanita, caramel creeper ceanothus, larger manzanita, some upright juniper, not big ones. I think they were under three feet. They were old gold variety. Uh, some boulders, small trees. And by the time we got done with it, this half acre, this half acre hillside was quite a showpiece. It wasn't just a flat green tapestry, you know, covered with a, a green ground cover of some kind. It had some depth, it had some foliage color to it, it had some color color to it, and it looked good. And the customers were really, really happy. They enjoyed that hillside and it did the job. It did the job, which is what we're gonna talk about in just a second. So when I kind of thought that hillside out, it basically had to do with the root systems of the plants I selected, the environment that I was putting them into, and the long-term, long-term um, environment that I was putting into. So it wouldn't be something that would last three to five years. It'd be something that would last a few decades. And that's important. And we're gonna cover that too. So our next big applications that could come into vogue is rock gardens, retaining walls, and fillers for patios made out of flagstone or block stone, something like that. So when you're talking about rock gardens, you're talking about a smaller scale ground cover. Red Cardinal, Red Cardinal. You're talking about a smaller scale ground cover, one that is not gonna overrun the place. I got a story to share you about that in just a second. But you're talking about things that will go in and around and not overwhelm. So when you have those kinds of ground covers, we're not talking about juniper necessarily. We're not talking about manzanita. We're not talking about African daisy. We're talking about things that are smaller and slower so that not only can you maintain them, but they won't become invasive. When you're talking about retaining walls, you're common, a combination type of ground cover. You're talking about one that'll probably stabilize the soil that was backfilled behind that retainer, but then also do the job of as a spiller, one that will come over the wall, soften the edges of a hard retaining cement wall, block wall, something with a, with a wall cap on it or something. So it looks good. It looks good and at times it's probably even colorful. And lastly is a filler. Now many times you've seen large flagstone patios, at least online in photos, but planting in between the joints and allowing a ground cover to fill in and soften the soils and the edges of those flagstones so they really look good as they start to mature. Again, a smaller scale ground cover, not one that's going to grow up and over and across all the stone. It's actually going to be fairly easy to keep it in the joint areas of that flagstone patio. We'll talk about some of those selections as well. So back in the olden days, like I started the show, that would be the 1970s and early 80s. Yep. Um, yards back in then, even in the Bay Area where I was practicing at the time, yards were bigger. Uh, they weren't the dinky little 50 by 100 foot or 50 by 100 by 75 foot lots that you see in some residential developments today. Bigger called for a more aggressive ground cover. 
But when you're talking about a retainer wall, you're talking about a filler, you're talking about a spiller, you're talking about a filler in between stonework, you're not talking about African daisy. You're not talking about ice plant. You're talking stuff that's more along the lines of Corsican mint, um, blue star creeper, baby tear, maybe scotch or Irish moss, uh, some creeping thyme. And those guys are smaller scale, far less invasive, as opposed to the African daisy, juniper, ice plant, uh, some trailing lantana, and one other that I'll share about you with you in the story. Now, the story came from an actual landscape job that I did. It was in Castro Valley, California, when I was first practicing. And I had put down this flagstone patio, and it had joints roughly about that wide in between because the people deliberately wanted to soften them with ground cover in between. A very in vogue style back then. Well, I came up with, I think, four selections for them, four or five selections. And they said, nope, the one we want is Myoporum parvifolium, or I think it's called uh, Australian bubalia. It's an Australian native. Anyway, I said, well, you know, we we could put that in and it would probably look really good when we first put it in but by the end of a 12 month period you're not going to see your patio it's going to go ape and it's going to go not just in the joints it's going to go across the stones and and up onto the wall you know and build up and then you're going to come in and trim it and then it's going to raise up and i said i just don't think you're going to be very happy with it can we stick with these little suggestions no, we really like that. We like the white flower on it. We think it really looks nice. <laughs> okay, all right. So we went down that path. I went and got a couple of flats of myoporum and planted it in. They said, oh, look how good it looks. Look, I said, yeah. Oh, by the way, I have this little disclaimer right here. Would you mind signing it? Oh, sure, it's not gonna be a problem. Thank you very much, Matt. So nine months later, almost to the day, I get a phone call. And the phone call was, um, Matt, you were right, and we were wrong, and we can't see our patio, just like you said. We had to go in and pull everything out. Do you think you could come back and go over those other selections with us and replant it? We'll be more than happy to pay you for it. And sure enough, I did, and they were very happy. I believe what I put in there, what I put in was uh, uh, Corsican, a combination of Corsican mint and thyme, both of them, because there was a little of a shadier spot up towards the door. So we kind of blended the, the sun versus shade stuff. And it turned out okay. It's a much slower ground cover, a much slower fill. So I planted it just a little bit heavier, but not too much. And I never heard from them again, so I'm assuming it worked out all right. I think there's a big difference between uh, the 70s and 80s versus the, the time we're in now. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think people's lifestyles allow for a lot of time and patience for things to fill in and grow. And that lends me to another mistake that people make about ground covers, and that is certainly overplanting. Uh, if they think three is good, then six is better. And that is not the case with many, many ground covers. You're just inviting an overwhelming type of plant or uh, a crowding of the plant. So you don't get the effect that you want and need, and you wonder why it's not successful. So overplanting is very, very important to avoid, to set it aside. And if you look at the tags on most of your ground covers, the little, the little pull tag, a little fold over tag, it'll always say a spacing recommendation. And most of the time you can follow that to the letter and you'll be perfectly fine. When they do those spacing tags, they're considering a 12 to 18 month fill-in rate. That's what they're, they're gauging it on, that it'll end up just getting to the touching stage from the other plant. And that is good. You don't want to go 18 inches and say, oh, I'm going to put it 12. And all of a sudden they're growing together. And once they grow together, what do they do? They got no more place to go. So now they go up and you wanted a creeper. Now you got something that's going up six, eight inches and it's up above your flagstone or it's starting to impede where your annuals go or where your perennials are. And you basically screwed yourself. So follow the directions or you can watch me, either one. Prepping for ground cover, you know, when you're planting, I follow the same planting plan that I do for trees and shrubs and everything else. Individual holes or general area is always going to be uh, 
approached with a 50-50 approach. 50-50 of whatever soil you have there with a 50 mix of planting mix or organic compost and then mix in a, a, little, a little pinch of starter fertilizer and you mix that all in and you put your ground cover in it. Whether it's a gallon can, whether it's a four inch, whether it's a cell pack, or whether it's a mud flat start, it doesn't matter. You're wanting to prepare that hole for success for that ground cover to get started, to allow it to have a little bit of moisture in there and be able to thrive for successful planting. Let's cover another topic about ground covers and that's watering. The difference, the difference between ground covers and turf is turf are a thirsty bitch. They really are. They need to be moist and soaked on a regular basis. What, a half inch to three quarters of an inch of water a week in order for a lawn to really be at its peak performance, especially in the warmer months. Ground covers are just slightly different. You know, you can take a uh, emerald carpet manzanita, something that's a very drought tolerant type of plant when it's established. And you can take something like a scotch moss or a baby tear, but let's use scotch moss as an example. Believe it or not, the manzanita will stand more water than that scotch moss. Can you believe that? When you overwater scotch moss, it will rot. It will rot like a bad head of lettuce in the vegetable bin in your fridge. The indication on the manzanita from overwatering is it'll start yellowing at the stems back towards the base. That's the indication that, yep, I'm soaking wet and stop watering me. Most ground covers want to get uh, a good soaking on planting and then let them, let them sit for a little while and then come back and water them lightly. They don't want to be saturated like a lawn. Like if you put in a new sod lawn, you could water that thing three times a day for 15 minutes a shot in July and it'll still, it'll still want more water. You can't overwater them hardly at all. So think about it in a little different water conservation approach. That's the great thing about ground covers. Then once they get their foot going, once they, they take hold, then the watering, depending on the variety, can even be less. And there's the beauty of it. You know, you can get a good ground cover or a good spiller or a good cascader or a good uh, hillside erosion control without all the water being used all the time. If you're looking for one that is uh, kind of an industrial strength, uh, almost fail safe type of ground cover and you have a little bit of space in a, in a morning sun, maybe a little afternoon shade situation, you want one that can edge, you want something that you can mow, then try Blue Star Creeper. That one works for just about everybody. They're, it's the hardest one to fail on. And speaking of maintenance, if you want a ground cover that you can mow, you can mow Blue Star Creeper, I've done it. Uh, another one is Spring Syncofoil or Potentilla Verna. It's another, it's another ground cover that once established and fill in, you can run a mower over to that thing like you do your fescue lawn, not a problem. And it'll regenerate and then it'll rebloom as well. So think about uh, the maintain, maintenance angle. That's the greatest thing about ground covers is as opposed to a lawn that generally needs mowing once every seven days or 10 days at the most, your ground covers aren't gonna need anything but maybe once a month, maybe once a quarter, depending on the kind you put in there. So a maintenance angle, time freed up to do other stuff. That's a good thing. You know, ground cover selections are used all over our country, um, all over the world in various applications. They're hardy, hardy, hardy beasts and some are meant to go dormant in the wintertime. Say like for instance, uh, carpet bugle, ajuga, uh, the bronze ajuga or jungle bronze ajuga or the, the variegated one. Uh, it loves to run and grow and creep and crawl and bloom and do all its stuff. And then the wintertime, phew, especially in zones colder than six, yeah, they go, they go dormant and they almost die back to a particular root zone and they'll just sit there until spring. And when spring hits and it comes out, they throw all their beautiful purple blooms and they start creeping and crawling all over again. There are some other ones like manzanita, some like ice plant, others like uh, blue star creeper. They're pretty hardy guys and they will, they will stand winter's wrath without any problem. 
you just have to look and do a little due diligence and figure out which particular zone your ground cover is going to work in. Okay, let's talk about that new trend I promised you at the top of the show. One of the ones that I'm seeing on a regular basis now because of water conservation, mainly water conservation and maintenance, and that is ground covers are really coming in style and in vogue for lawn substitutes. Uh, if it wasn't for uh, the drought in Northern California back in the last big recession that we had, I probably would have gone under business-wise because nobody was doing nothing except what? They were ripping out their thirsty lawns because the city and county that I was living in and working in, you weren't able to water. You were not able to water, but maybe once a week. There was no water left for people. So people were jerking their lawns out, putting in artificial turf or putting in ground cover. And I want to share a couple of ground cover substitutes that you might want to think about. One that we use quite a bit out there on the west is called Daimondia. Daimondia is a wonderful lawn substitute. It's totally different than the emerald Kelly green of bluegrass and fescue or centipede grass or bahia or bermuda. It's a different look altogether and it gives you a beautiful bloom in the spring and summertime. Check out Daimondia. I mentioned one earlier that's also quite uh, mowable, easy to maintain, and that's Potentilla verna, or spring syncofoil, another great lawn substitute. For you small scale lawn areas, say like uh, maybe definitely under 200 square feet, probably even under 100 square feet, there's a neat one called green carpet. It's also called hernia area, and you can look at it. It's a slow guy, so you have to plant them kind of close together, like eight inch or six inch spacing. Uh, you don't have to do anything to it. Once it fills in, you may have to edge it periodically, maybe twice a year, but that's about it. I mentioned Blue Star Creeper. Eh, I'm kind of on the fence as far as a lawn substitute on that. It's more of a, it's more of a spiller filler in between flagstones, but it does work rather well. Also clover. Now, I got to tell you, I don't speak from an experienced position as far as using clover as a lawn substitute. I have just seen it and read about it. It can be done. Although I do understand that clover does not last without reseeding about every three to five years. So lawn substitutes. So ground covers used correctly, the right plant in the right application with the right maintenance. Man, they are a fantastic way to add an addition and an additional depth to your landscape. Check them out. Those ones that you've seen here are a fantastic selections. They've been used for hundreds of years and I've used them dozens and hun just hundreds of times with a great deal of success. Great planting scheme, great spacing, uh, right plan and the right application, hillside stabilization. You know, you can use these in a variety of ways to get a variety of effects. I hope you have got something out of this. You really have. Down below is where you can send your questions. Don't forget about the book and the digital course. And guys, hey, I'm Matt, you can call me coach. Meanwhile, I'm gonna leave you with a little 30 second spot of some of the color that's going on here at the Knoxville, Tennessee Botanical Garden and Arboretum. I'll catch you guys next week. You guys take care, get the hands dirty, shall we?